The leaders of the BRICS countries are set to meet in August in South Africa. However, this summit, which is supposed to be a grouping of the leaders of some of the most powerful economies, some of the powerful emerging countries in the world, is run into a controversy over demands for the arrest of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, this debate has been going on for many months now. There has been debate inside South Africa, in the world, in other BRICS countries. There were even some reports of the summit maybe being moved. So what is the politics around it and what is more importantly happening in South Africa? We have with us Professor Mandla Haribe, who is Director of the Centre for Data and Digital Communications at the University of Johannesburg. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Professor. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for having me. Right. So first, let's go straight into the news, which is all these debates going on about uh, the arrest of uh, Vladimir Putin or the demands for the arrest. And there's been external pressure, of course, as you can guess. But I suspect internally also there's been a lot of discussion and debate about this. So maybe can you take us through what you see as the current situation on this issue? Yes, absolutely. You know, I think the starting point uh, for me is that uh, what is happening currently here in South Africa is that the government has been quite resolute that the BRICS summit will be held here in South Africa. Uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa has been engaging heads of states of the BRICS partners. Recently, President Ramaphosa had a telephonic discussions uh, with the, his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, where BRICS was obviously on the agenda. Obviously, this then um, uh, was subsequently followed by the visit uh, to Kiev as well as Moscow, uh, which President Ramaphosa led with a delegation of his African counterparts, I think about six uh, countries. But what is critical here is that South Africa's non-aligned stance uh, is also well documented and hence the recent the recent peace uh, mission to Ukraine as well as Russia. As early as yesterday, you may be aware of this fact that President Ramaphosa held uh, meetings uh, with his Brazilian counterpart, President Lula da Silva, on the sideline of the summit on, uh, I think it's on new global finance pact, financial pact, which is currently underway in France, in Paris. Uh, of course, uh, one of the interesting parts about BRICS is that if you have listened to President Lula's stance uh, with regard to what he also regards as a Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, sort of also complicates the situation a little bit. But uh, President Lula da Silva later revealed in his Twitter account that uh, his discussions uh, with President um, Ramaphosa focused mainly on the resolution of the conflict uh, in the Ukraine, an issue that uh, obviously the, pre the president, president says is imperative uh, in, prom in promoting peace. And he has been raising this issue as early as uh, January. Now, if you don't mind me continuing and reflect on some of the external pressures that South Africa has been experiencing, mm -hmm is that um, um, the, the fact of the matter is that South Africa is facing both um, what I will call uh, internal and external pressures. Uh, obviously, the external pressure is being exacted by the West, um, which uh, in my view has been, I mean, we all know it, it is funding uh, the war in Ukraine uh, through its uh, war alliance, NATO. They have deliberately argued, uh, especially the US, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that South Africa's non-aligned stance is uh, essentially a covert support for Russia. Uh, I suppose uh, the non-alignment for the West will simply mean South Africa coming out guns blazing against Russia in support of Ukraine. And hence the bizarre utterances you might have heard from the US ambassador to South Africa, uh, Ruben Brigittin. Uh, who made uh, some serious allegations that South Africa provided weapons um, and ammunition to Russia. Expectedly, this has been followed by a series of uh, threats by, by, by the US um, in a form of uh, threatening, excluding South Africa and isolation of South Africa from the AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, again, you may recall that there were four US congressmen 
uh, from both the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party who wrote an official letter uh, to the US President Joe Biden to this effect. And lastly, uh, it's been what I would call the internal pressure from South Africa. Inevitably, this has led to pressure from the opposition parties, especially what I would characterize as parties of the right parties on the right, the right wing parties, such as the Democratic Alliance, who obviously are accusing South Africa of siding with the rogue states and the rogue president like Putin. Of course, this is very important in the South African context when you take into account the fact that uh, uh, next year, uh, in 2024, South Africa will be embarking on a national general elections. Um, and this is putting the governing uh, party, the African National Congress, under severe pressure. Of course, um, linked to the, to the internal pressure has been the commentaries from the economic analysts, media pundits, as well as the commercial media in particular, which is very powerful and independent in South Africa. That is putting pressure on government as usual using frames such as human rights, economic right. collapse. Uh, because uh, I think the common narrative that you will find in South Africa is that uh, the country risks losing up to 40% of its trade uh, from its Western partners if the country were to be fully sanctioned um, by, by, by the US. You know, many South Africans are genuinely concerned uh, about this possibility because as we may also know that our economy has been ailing. I mean, it has been stagnant for over well over a decade now. The middle class in particular, I mean, hates being inconvenienced. If you put the pressures of the constant power cuts that the country has been facing, the escalating interest rates uh, from the Reserve Bank, which is squeezing the middle class, therefore you can understand this serious political pressure that the governing party finds itself under. Right, that's a very comprehensive analysis. But also to extend that analysis further, I wanted to sort of uh, ask you how the situation has been overall since the Ukraine war started. How has South Africa sort of navigated, uh, you know, the kind of pressures that are coming in, not just at this moment, but for the past one and a half years? Obviously, you, you, you know, you have to locate this uh, from the emergence of Russia. I think South Africa, um, the governing party in particular, has been very uh, clear and resolute in its views that uh, the current economic trajectory, uh, which is a continuation of the past of the apartheid system, which therefore uh, makes South Africa reliant uh, on the West, it has to be stopped at, at a particular point. And therefore, there have been quite a number of uh, overtures uh, in trying to create links, uh, particularly with the, the, the big Asian economy, uh, India uh, and, and China, but as well as other pa uh, partners uh, in Latin America, which is very important. Uh, so this is an ongoing um, uh, uh, issue. But obviously, when a country faces uh, quite a number of internal challenges, such as a stagnant economy, growing unemployment, growing rates of poverty, growing inequality, I mean, South Africa is by far one of right. the most unequal societies in the world, that creates pressure, pressures that sort of makes everyone to be internally uh, focused. And that has uh, put South Africa in, uh, in a very tight situation where it finds itself. Hence, um, it, it cannot afford actually, to, uh, uh, if you ask me, uh, to lose the economic benefits that comes with this alliance and working partnership with the West. Right. And Professor, in this context, of course, also looking at BRICS itself. Now, uh, we do know that uh, in the previous years, BRICS had kind of suffered a bit of a uh, you know, it suffered a bit of a recession of its own, if you can call it so. It kind of vanished from the picture for a bit. But now there's been renewed interest uh, in BRICS, of course, partly due to the Ukraine war, partly due to the fact that many more countries are now uh, sort of wanting to join the bloc, also due to the fact that many of the key members of BRICS have taken a very strong position when it comes to global affairs also now. So all this together, BRICS has suddenly emerged or re-emerged as one of the key groupings that people are looking uh, up to, looking at with a great deal of interest. So how does South Africa see its role in this grouping? Well, well, well um, I think it, it, it may be uh, helpful to sort of try and trace 
uh, the history of BRICS and how it emerges. You may recall that BRICS emerges um, as a form of a solidarity program that sought to enable like-minded nations uh, to negotiate as a bloc. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, 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 you can therefore not understand the BRICS uh, outside of IPSA, right. India, Brazil, and South Africa program that emerged as a basis of the AIDS negotiation, uh, which the West was selling to South Africa at an exorbitant price. You may recall that India was therefore prepared to sell the same drugs uh, to South Africa at extremely reduced uh, prices. But of course, th those are sort of being blocked uh, by the West. Uh, the objective um, was to therefore create this form of solidarity and negotiate as a bloc. This objective, in my view, remains quite pertinent because, um, and in, in, in essence, this is internationalism in action because Absolutely. partnerships based on concrete needs of nations and humanity are very important. The principle must uh, therefore be to the continuation uh, of the basic of BRICS, uh, whether it expands, uh, but at the basis of that, it must be the putting of people first before profit. Its expansion cannot therefore ignore these forms of solidarity um, and these forms of ensuring that um, we protect our planet, we put the needs of uh, the poor people uh, first and make sure that uh, humanity stands for what is uh, good. And I think for me, that's what is important. And I think that's what makes uh, uh, makes BRICS interesting to other parties, and but also it, it, it can't ex escape the fact that it becomes therefore an ideological platform. Right. Uh, so in this context, also looking at this moment we're talking about, especially the past one and a half years, I also wanted to see the larger regional implications from your perspective in South Africa, because like you said, for instance, recently we had uh, a delegation from African countries, key leaders, uh, key presidents visiting both uh, Ukraine and Russia, but even earlier during various uh, votes on sanctions, for instance, uh, many African countries have banded together, also sort of uh, made a statement that they're not willing to just be pushed around and accept the framing of the the West's framing of the global situation right now. So how has uh, South Africa also, I think, dealt or navigated in the region in this one and a half years? What have been the kind of collaboration, the alliances that are sort of built up? Well, I think, firstly, we must appreciate the uh, promising signs that are emerging from the African continent that seeks to assert its independence, but also African unity. I mean, you look at the developments um, in Mali, in the west of the African continent, uh, you get that, you look at the utterances that are coming from the east of Africa, Kenyan president, um, again, it sought to affirm, affirm that, but it's not easy. Uh, and I think that, in my view, South Africa has not been able um, to push uh, as it should have um, for the BRICS agenda, which requires a solid, united Africa as a bloc. Uh, if you look back uh, around mid-2000, South Africa was uh, quite aggressive and, and at the forefront of, transformation, of transforming the organization of African unity to, into the African Union. Uh, driving effectively uh, the Africa agenda. Um, this led to the emergence of uh, programs such as the New Partnership for Africa's uh, Development, uh, which was part of this agenda. But in the last decade, I think, uh, as, as I have already alluded to, that um, the, there has been some serious contestation, especially by the former colonies, uh, using the economic stick and carrot mm -hmm. approach, uh, particularly the in the francophone countries. I mean, South Africa was pushed deeply, uh, and our soldiers were killed uh, in the Central African uh, Republic uh, by the French colony because you could see that there was that contestation. Um, uh, but the region, uh, in my view, sees value in BRICS. Uh, African countries are, uh, have been pushing to be part of the BRICS. I mean, if you think about Nigeria, which is Africa's second largest economy, has been pushing quite hard uh, to be part of the BRICS, uh, for BRICS to be expanded, because 
they see a value in the unity and this uh, block negotiation um, in driving this uh, solid solidarity. But I think that the glue that, in my view, that will hold BRICS together right. uh, should be an, a minimum program uh, of these, uh, what I would call progressive countries that will seek to assert a multipolar perspective as a basis of uh, building a better world that will benefit humanity. Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, countries like Mali, for instance, where there's been a very strong internal process. In fact, a constitutional referendum, I believe, is going on as, we, as has already taken place as we are recording. And uh, many of these places, mass upsurges taking place against imperialism, against the former colonizers. So in this context, how has the dynamic been inside South Africa itself? Has there been, a, shall we say, a rise in anti-imperialist spirit, especially among the organized uh, workers, for instance, among the masses? Uh, you mentioned that there are some sections which are clearly taking a pro-Western stance. The opposition, for instance, right-wing opposition, the big media. But generally, what has been uh, the sentiment among the populists, if I may ask? Well, well, I think South Africa could be understand could be understood as um, if I can give you a bit uh, a bit a bit of history of uh, South Africa that I'm sure you might be uh, familiar with, is that um, the 1910 formation of the African Union essentially created two nations in South Africa: the white nation and the black nation. And by black, I mean black in general, Africans, Indians, and the so-called colored people uh, in South Africa. That so sort of created what I would call the people's camp uh, that sought to drive the liberation struggle and what was then regarded on, on the other side as the enemy's camp. Um, that was the basis of the internationalism that that was formed in South Africa as a basis platform to, to fight for liberation. Um, therefore, the progressive countries of the East um, uh, supported this uh, drive for freedom. I think Russia was quite central to that. We all know the Cubans, um, the Indian comrades, the, the Chinese. Largely, I think South Africa has remained uh, with that huge block of progressive um, uh, uh, politics uh, in that regard. Of course, there's a small po population that's, uh, that still is still aligned uh, to NATO countries for historical reasons. Uh, of course, uh, the majority of the population, in my view, in the movements remained uh, broadly left and anti-imperialist. However, of course, the proof will be in the inability, in my view, of, of, of South Africa withstanding economic pressures. Right. Because um, it is where, where the minority can use its financial muscle. Because the minority in South Africa still controls the economy, mm -hmm. still controls huge part uh, of the commercial media. And through these media platforms, including the technological um, emerging techno technological platforms, they are using them to assert their dominant views in support of the NATO alliance. Uh, because um, if you think about it, if you analyze how the South African media, the commercial media, covers the war, you would swear that South Africa is completely against uh, Russia. Where else when you go on the ground on workers' platforms, uh, whether it's organized labor, whether it's civil movement, um, you will still find a sense that a vast majority of South Africans, they tend to side with, um, uh, with the progressive forces. I think it's also the same case uh, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestine uh, uh, occupation. You, I mean, if you read the media, you'll You'll be you'll think that this issue does not exist in the South in South Africa, but a huge population of South Africans um, are in support of the struggle of the people of Palestine and other oppressed people of the world. But of course, at the heart of this of this division in South Africa has been uh, our inability to resolve the national question. Indeed, uh, we must accept the fact that we are a unique. A country in South Africa with a, a huge secular, European secular community outside of Europe, found anywhere. We've got a huge Indian population in this country. 
So this complicates our efforts to forge a new nation, you know, that will be, whose glue that will hold it together will include a common economy, a common language, and a common culture. So all those, those dynamics are, are at play in South Africa if you, if you want to analyze uh, this uh, regional and international balance of forces and politics. We have to navigate some of some of those things. But I, I, the long and short, I think that the vast majority, my reading is that the vast majority of um, the people in South Africa remain in what I would call the people's camp, the progressive politics. Thank you so much, Professor, for talking to us and giving us an understanding of, I think, of course, the immediate context to the BRICS summit, but also the larger geopolitical trends, uh, shall we say, in the region as well and in South Africa. Very useful to understand uh, the perspectives of various BRICS countries as we move towards the summit. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And that's all we have time for today. The BRICS summit in the coming months, definitely a major point of interest. The debates and even controversies might keep increasing. We'll be tracking it very closely on People's Dispatch. Until then, do visit our website, follow us on all our social media platforms and see you soon.